Hello. I got a lot of feedback that you were interested in knowing more about JS tracing, so I want to make an overview video. Before I start, I want to give a few disclaimers. First, JS tracing is not the only way to trace the cases that it solves, so if you think of a slight modification that makes sense for you, go for it. The greatest advantage of JS tracing is that it makes tracing of complex cases very linear and intuitive. Second, JS tracing uses a very large number of algorithms, specifically UFUR and FUUR 2E2Es, two flips, and full floating for edges, UFUR 2E2C, two twists, and full floating for corners. To start our discussion on JS tracing, let's keep in mind its purpose, which is to decrease the number of words memorized per cube during multi-blind. To do this, we will float preemptively without knowing if we have a closed floating cycle. That's where the 2e2e and 2e2c algs come in. If we float preemptively but find a non-even cycle, we can close it using one of these algorithms. Let's start with edges. I'll use a lot of examples to hopefully th make things more clear, but feel free to leave questions down in the comments if something is still confusing. In this first case, we hit the buffer, which happens to be flipped and weak swapped, so immediately float to UB. There is an, this is a non-even cycle, and in this case, it's just a single target. For this scenario, there are multiple possible approaches to memorize and solve this case with a single word. We need to find a specific way to decode this case into letters that we can convert into a word to memorize. To explain the way JS tracing solves this for edges, I'll first need to define what I call good or bad sides of a piece. You can also think of it as dominant or, or primary sides, if that makes more sense to you. Basically, we'll define UD faces to be the primary sides. If there's no UD on the piece, FB will become primary. That means that L and R are always the least dominant sides. So for my orientation, which is blue top, white front, blue and green are always going to be dominant. So in this case, RU, BU are dominant. If there is no green or, or blue, then white and yellow becomes dominant. So in this case, UL. It might take some practice to get used to seeing pieces in this way, but this method allows for instantaneous recognitions of two E2Es. Let's go back to the first case we were looking at. We can quickly find the dominant side of each piece, which in this case is DF and BU. Then, to memorize the 2E2E, two e, I simply string the two letters that are on the dominant sides. More specifically, the order I memorize the targets is the reverse order of my floating buffers. That is what makes most sense to me when I memorize the 2E2Es two e in the end of a floating cycle, and I'll explain why in the next examples. But in this case, it would be C, K, which can be solved with this algorithm. The, this method of recognizing 2E2Es two e has many benefits. The first is that it allows for linear tracing, meaning that you do not have to ever backtrack to find out what you're solving. The second advantage is that there's very little mental work to find the 2E2E. Two e. This should be more become more clear in the next examples. The third benefit is that it allows for a very intuitive differentiation between UFUR and FUUR 2E2E two e cases. Tied to this is the fourth benefit, which is that if you are tracking your buffer orientation, it allows for predicting which 2E2E two e alg you will get, which can make tracing even faster and easier. Okay, now for the second example. So here again, our buffer is solved, so we'll float to UB. Go to here, to here, to here, and now here we hit our buffer. And notice that at the end of tracing, when we hit our buffer, we hit the dominant side of the piece. This is a way to know that we have a UFUR2E2E. UF, UR, and not an FUUR2E2E, which immediately tells us which case we have. 
This is why I chose the order of letters for decoding tweetwees as the inverted order of my buffer sequence. This order allows for me to do linear tracing and faster recognition, even if I didn't keep track of the buffer orientation. So in this case, solve the floating algorithm, and then the tweetwee. Okay, let's do one more example. So here, our buffer is solved, flipped. So we'll float to UB, go to here, here, to here. And this is our buffer. This time, when we hit the buffer, we hit the non-dominant side. This means that we have an FUUR2E2E. And in this case, we can solve it like this. Before we go on to corners, I would like to mention that there are many other cases that will come up, and some of them can be a little tricky, especially for cases when you hit your buffer as the even target, such as here, where you are solved at the first, or you are solved, and our first target is our buffer. My recommendation for this case, or this type of case, is to use your intuition. Over time, based on how many targets you have solved before you reach your buffer, you can predict whether or not you will should solve the piece to UR or if you should start a new cycle. After you build your intuition, you'll get it right almost every single time. In this specific case, if you solve to UR, you'll get one floating algorithm and that'll be two words. And if you break to UB, you'll have three words to memorize. Finally, if you get a misoriented cycle that leaves you with your floating buffer flipped, make sure to combine it with the, any other floating flips, if there are any to memorize, and memorize them together. This will allow you to reduce the amount of words for that cube. Now let's move on to corners. Corners, surprisingly, have a much more un simple JS tracing approach, which I'll show you in an example. Here, when we reach our buffer, we can float to UFL, and from here, we can normally trace until we reach our buffer. We reached our floating buffer at the odd target, meaning that we don't have a closed cycle. We can solve this with a 2E2C, where the first target is the one we just memorized, and the second target is the UD target of that same piece. This allows for very simple and linear tracing of the floating cycle. This same tracing approach can be also used in JS tracing for floating 2 e to cs to further save words. So to solve the specific example, we have here to here to here, and then the 2 e to c so the first target is DFL, and the second one is LUF. So solve it like that. If the floating cycle is even but misoriented, we will have the floating buffer flipped, uh, twisted. Again, if there is another twist in the cube, we can combine these to save a word in our memorization. I realize that this overview of JS tracing is quite dense. There's a lot involved with JS tracing, but it really isn't as complicated as it might seem. If you're interested in applying this to your solves, I recommend going one case at a time and if you find a complicated case, take some time to analyze it. After some time, it gets much more simple and intuitive. Please feel free to leave me any feedback or ask questions in the comments. I hope to be able to make an actual structured tutorial of JS tracing in the future with more in-depth examples and more comprehensive tips on how to decrease the cognitive load. But for now, I hope that this quick overview was helpful to understand better the basics of JS tracing. Thank you for watching.